Latter-day Contemplation is a podcast hosted by two Latter-day Saints who have found great value in experiencing God through walking a path of contemplation. The views expressed herein are our own. Hello and welcome to Latter-day Contemplation. We are your hosts, Christopher Hurtado and Riley Risto. Latter-day Contemplation started as an exploration of contemplative practices from many traditions to enhance our discipleship of Jesus Christ. We're by no means experts in the topics we discuss, but what we have is an openness to questions, a hunger to discover truth wherever we can find it, and a desire to share in the transformative life of inner peace. We love that you've joined us, and we hope that you find value in this community. Hello and welcome back to Latter-day Contemplation. I'm Riley Risto. And I'm Christopher Hurtado. Chris, today we're joined by guest Greg Olson, renowned LDS artist, and we're really excited to have him in the, we'll call it the Heber studio. He's joining me in my office today. Welcome, Greg. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you for being here. So, Greg, we have been talking for, I don't know, months, Chris, about doing an episode on art. We're both art lovers, art appreciators. Uh, I wouldn't call us aficionados or anything, but uh, we definitely have a deep appreciation and love for art of all kinds, poetry, visual arts, uh, you name it. And and we've been wanting to do an episode like this. And Greg, it was your son, Nate, who reached out to us through Latter-day Peace Studies. And, you know, we've we've had a lot of people invite themselves on the program before, and we turned down those self-promoters for the most part. But this one intrigued us. Greg, you're, you're a Latter-day Saint, yes. uh, practicing Latter-day Saint, and in this community, I think you're pretty well-known. Um, at least people are familiar with some of your art, at the very least. They've seen some of your paintings, and m- many Latter-day Saints that I know have your work in their homes, and so that's a great testament to you, I think, and so I, I thought this was a great opportunity to have a couple conversations. One is the conversation with a Latter-day Saint artist. The other one is the conversation with an artist. And and then we can talk about art generally and, and the, the effect it has upon us and why it is we're so fascinated by it. So before we get started with any of that conversation, let's just get a little background on you, Greg. What, what can you tell us about yourself? Well, first of all, I want to say I, I'm, I'm not here self-promoting. No. <laughs> but actually, our, our son Nate reached out because uh, he and some of his sisters had heard your podcast, and it really resonated with them. And so they turned me on to you guys, and and I listened to some episodes, and, and it really resonated with me also. So anyway, I, uh, I grew up in a little place called Iona, Idaho, uh, farming community outside of Idaho Falls. Grew up uh, in the church, have, you know, pioneer ancestors and all of that stuff. Served a mission in Toronto, Canada. I went to Utah State University and studied art there. And after my mission, I met my wife, Sydney. She's from Salt Lake and uh, we married. We've got uh, six kids, five daughters, one son. And I think, uh, 17 grandkids and another one on the way, we just found out. So, And I met Sydney and I met your son, Nate, and they're lovely people. And I, I do want to apologize. It, it sounded like I was implying that you were self Oh, I, I'm just playing with you. No, yeah. but that that's an important point to make because, uh, you know, when Nate reached out, he did so as a fan of the show and he thought this would actually be a really interesting conversation to have. And I agree completely. And so I've been excited about this for a couple of weeks now. We talked about doing this two weeks ago, and I was ready to record day one. And, right. and you wanted to take just a little <laughs> time to think through this a little bit, go through the questions, and and also you had a uh, you had a camping trip planned. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate you giving me a little <laughs> extra time. I'm not the most articulate guy. I spend most of my time by myself in my studio. If I talk to anybody, it's just to myself most of the time. Uh, and so uh, I appreciated the time to just kind of contemplate and think about what we might discuss here. And, and I had a great experience. Every every year, I like to get out for a few days just by myself. That's my therapy, you know, get out in nature and 
Do you just, think that uh, makes you a better artist, that level of solitude and, and kind of reconnecting with the self and with your surroundings? I don't know if it does. Uh, I hope it does. And, and I always feel better afterwards, you know, just seeing new things. There's always something stimulating about new places and and just spending time alone with your own thoughts and contemplating. I, I do a lot of meditating and just spending inward time kind of and that's a lot of my ideas come from that sort of experience so it's always a good thing for me what is how how long have you been meditating what does your meditation practice look like if that's not too personal uh, well question. no I, I i credit my wife sydney she uh she probably uh got me started doing that and at first it's kind of you know i i struggled with it like how do you do it right and do you have to sit in a certain pose and how do you clear your mind totally and and I worried so much about those things it was almost counterproductive and then I just sort of forgot about all those you know shoulds and rules about how you do it and just found that if I just spent time in stillness for me that was productive just just calming my mind and you know when you close your eyes you shut out the world around you the world that you normally operate in and when you when you go inward i think you that's a new world you know and that's kind of where i discovered myself and i i think when they talk about you know the kingdom of heaven is within us i i i've really found that to be the case. And it's nothing for me happened magically in any particular meditating experience. It's kind of a cumulative effect. And so I find when things get stressful, that place of stillness is a place I've been before. It's kind of familiar and it's easier to get back there. So for me, it's it's been a wonderful practice. And it's not to, you know, I try to find 15, 20 minutes, a half an hour if I can, usually in the morning or at night before I go to bed. And uh, and it's just something that's been a great, great experience for me. That's an awesome, awesome description. We've, we've had people say to us in the past, like, how do you do this? How do you find the time for it? it I'm so bombarded by all of my responsibilities and daily tasks and distractions how do you find time for 15, 20 minutes to yeah. be still? Well, <laughs> I was just saying, my job allows me a lot of freedom. I was just saying I, I just sit around and doodle and color all day, so I don't have necessarily a schedule that I have to stick to. So uh, when I go to my studio in the morning, that might be the first thing that I do before I start painting. And so it's kind of part of my work day. So I kind of have a luxury that not everyone has, but I think I've 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 had times when I where I've been able to condense that experience into just four or five minutes. You know, it's not necessarily about a practice, it's about that state of being. And it gets easier and easier to just go Move there. Right in the it. middle of the day, you know, what you know, if you're in the drive through at uh, at McDonald's or something, you, you can still find that place. How long have you been practicing? Oh, it's been several years now. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, the last decade, something like that. I ask because of the cumulative uh, effect that you mentioned, right? It does. And yet, you know, I haven't been practicing as long as you have, Greg, and I've still had that experience. And, and it really does. It's something that it's not about necessarily about quantity. Although I remember Phil McLemore, who we've had on the podcast, telling me, there really is something to spending at least 20 minutes. There are other times, you know, there are times where you can get in less time and, and you know, you can get there faster, if you will. One of the ways to, to be sure not to get there, though, is to try to get there faster. Yes, exactly. <laughs> try. Yeah. That won't work, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, if you can just learn to sit still and be present, you know, it come, it's, a, it's an exercise, right? It's something that you get better at it with practice. And and there really is something to 20 minutes, just like when it comes to getting your heart rate up for 20 minutes, maybe something like that. But it's uh, but of course, it's not about getting your heart rate up. It's actually about being still. 
Yeah, that's true. I find that there's sort of a zone you get into. I find the same thing when I'm painting. Painting is actually kind of a, a meditation in and of itself. I, When I get in front of the easel, for the first 15 minutes, I feel like I'm just wasting time. I don't get into it. You know, I'm just messing around. But if I stay there, maybe 20 minutes or so, just without even noticing it, I kind of slip into, I call it the zone. And then it's just fun, you know, and I'm accomplishing stuff without really even trying to. It happens, uh, not magically, but but you're in the flow of it. And it's, it, it's there's no place you'd rather be. It's just a, a real sweet spot. Yeah, it's interesting to me, Greg, that you that you say you practice meditation and you talk about it as a, and it is, it's, you're talking about it as a separate practice because it is a separate practice from your painting. And yet the practice of the artist is meditative, right? Yeah. It's a solitary meditative practice. I, I think it's, it's a testament to, to the idea of, you know, meditation itself uh, as separate from your, from your work as an artist that, that it's so valuable, that you actually find it valuable to spend that time on top of the time that you spend uh, doing the same thing in some sense as an artist. That's interesting. I, I've noticed sometimes when I'm painting a certain subject, maybe it's a landscape or a model, it can just be a simple object. I found that just any single object, there is enough interest and information to absorb from anything around us to to really entertain us for hours if we really get into it you know everything is miraculous almost the the deeper you go into to anything you know this chair next to me it, it, what an amazing design and its whole creation is just to bring me comfort when i sit in it you know uh you you develop a, a sense of gratitude just through observation yeah, I think it was Camus who said that you only really need to live one day to have enough to keep your mind busy for the rest <laughs> of your life, yeah. even if you'd only lived one day. And I know that uh, another contemplative author, uh, Karl Vakanovskard, is writing each day or was at some point about an object, just spending time writing about one object, whether it's a toothbrush or what have you. Wow. Yeah, I concur. Well, that sounds very much like what you're describing, though, the depth of experience. And it doesn't even have to be sensory experience in terms of the five senses. You can find that depth in stillness, closing your eyes and getting into that zone Absolutely. without utilizing touch, you know, smell, hear, seeing. Yeah, exactly. Well, it sounds like you're right up our alley. You're a natural contemplative, one that's uh, been practicing a long time. And as you were describing your own practice, I think both Chris and I heard a lot of our own experience in that. Uh, would you concur, Chris? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about art and your your journey through art, how you came to be a a professional artist and maybe how you started and then where you are now. How did you begin? You say you studied this in college, but how did you how did you transform into a career artist? Oh, Greg Olson, the career wow, artist. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I think it all started in the little town of Iona. There's not a lot of things to do for entertainment there, so what you find to do is usually stuff you invent yourself, and and drawing was one of those things. So I always enjoyed it as a kid. I'd fill up sketchbooks, and then in high school. I really had an exceptional teacher. I took an art class, and uh, Mr. Whitney was his name. I'm still friends with him today. Uh, but he uh, he would introduce us to professional artists in the area. And so by the time I was about a sophomore in high school, I decided that looks like more fun than milking cows and irrigating. You know? and so, And I was just naive enough to think that you just decide to be an artist and that's what you do. So I, I went to college and studied it and, you know, continued to learn my craft. And that was very helpful. But the thing they don't teach you in art school is really what to do with your skill, your craft when, when you get out of school. So, uh, 
that was kind of a rude awakening. But again, I think that's where being kind of naive uh, served me well because I, I really didn't have a backup plan. I just decided to be an artist and went for it and thought that's just all you had to do. And So was, you're painting <laughs> cowboys. <laughs> At first, when I, I, I left school, I left Utah State after I got engaged and got got married actually and uh and I worked as an in-house artist for a company in Salt Lake called the Exhibit Company and they produced visitor centers and trade show displays and I was the odd job artist I would do signage and murals or whatever they needed and after about a year and a half of doing that I had lunch with an old friend actually a, a missionary companion who we got talking about what we were doing, and I told him where I was working. He said, uh, if you could do whatever you wanted, Greg, what would that be? And I, I said, well, I really, I'd like to just paint, you know, just quit my job and paint paintings and, you know, have people buy them. And uh, he asked me some weird questions. He asked me, you know, how much our rent was. And at the time, we had a little two-bedroom apartment, one baby, and our rent was $197 a month. And our car was paid for. And he said, Greg, it's not going to get any easier. <laughs> you might as well give it a shot. So we got psyched up. And I, long story short, I quit my job and just started painting. This same friend, his father was a well-to-do doctor in Salt Lake. And they volunteered to have an art show in a couple of months to kind of kick off my new freelance career as a painter. And uh, we'd saved enough to live for a couple of months without a paycheck. So I painted like crazy, framed up old college art assignments, and we had an art show. And this this family was great. They I think they got on the phone and invited all their friends and neighbors, and uh, we, we had an art show. And it, it was lovely. We had some nice invitations and nice refreshments. And that night of the art show, we sold enough. Uh, to pay for our nice refreshments and invitations. <laughs> so I thought, what the heck have I done? Uh, and I was really depressed for about a week because this was not going the way, you know, we thought it would. But after a week, somebody who was at the show called and said, you know, we didn't like anything you had at the show, but would you be interested in a commission? And Oh, yeah. So anyway, uh, really for the next decade, that's how it was try to just paint one, sell one kind of a thing. I was only doing originals and and it was a real roller coaster. But uh, Western art was kind of hot at the time. I ended up moving my family to Arizona, a lot of Western galleries there. And that's kind of what I was doing till the, uh, oh, early 90s. No, late, late 80s. There's something to be said for, well, for mentors for one. It sounds like you had a really good mentor, and we, Riley and I know that can make a big difference. We recorded an episode on mentors, and then for not having a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let's let's go through that journey. You said you you started doing commissions and a lot of one-off stuff, but eventually you ran into a, like a publishing company. Yeah, uh, I was trying to. Well, first of all, I. I sent out, this was back in the day before internet, I, I made up, I think, 21 slide portfolios of my work and sent them to art publishers to uh, try to get someone to take me on and publish my work so that I was, you know, limited edition prints were coming on the scene and and that would be a big help if I didn't have to live just on the sale of my original. So anyway, I sent those out to the major publishers in the United States. And I think I got back 19 nice, no thank you letters and two just didn't respond at all. So I decided to try to publish myself and it's really easy to get prints printed. It's really hard to get rid, get rid of them. I had thousands in my basement and uh, did that for a couple of years. Then one of those publishers that had sent me a nice, no thank you letter Two or three years later, saw some of my new work, and we uh, came to an agreement, and and they started publishing my work, which was at the time some Western stuff, but mostly since we had a family, young kids at the time, I started doing a lot of themes with kids in them, 
you know, they were handy inspiration. And so that's what this publisher was interested in. But I was doing some uh, kind of maybe biblical or religious inspirational pieces just for myself, kind of, you know, I'd paint things that were important to me, my family, you know, my friends, my faith, uh, but no galleries or really even collectors were really buying the the religious kind of work at the time. But this publisher saw an, uh, a slide of a piece I'd done with uh, Jesus in it, and they kind of took a gamble and decided to print one. And lo and behold, it sold out, and they decided this might be, you know, a viable genre. Do you remember what that piece was called? Yeah, it was called uh, In His Constant Care. I had had a chance because of the generosity of a collector to go to Israel. And uh, this collector said, I think this, you know, just going there might influence your work someday. As it turns out, it it really did. It was a very generous, kind thing because we couldn't have gone on our own. So this was an image of Jesus in a courtyard uh, extending his hand to some little sparrows feeding them. And, uh, And that was the first print that came out with that was sort of Jesus oriented. And how many times have you painted Jesus since then? <laughs> I, don't know. I still do other things, but that's, you know, when you're, when you're in such a weird field, you know, as art, I mean, all of the arts are weird in the sense that there's no, no mapped out course to take every, every artist, whether it's, you know, music, drama, theater, uh, the visual arts, they're so unique. Um, so I, uh, I followed wherever, you know, sales took me at the time because that's mm-hmm. what was feeding my family. And although it was something that I loved, I never had any intention of being a quote unquote religious or Christian artist. Mm-hmm. But, but that's kind of what opened up. And so you could go where the food is at the time. And, and so now you're like, you know, 25 years or something like yeah, that yeah. into that journey. Yeah. 30 plus. 30? Yeah. Yeah. And listeners can find, you know, the the painting that that Greg mentioned in his constant care by Googling it. It's on his website. I just Googled it myself and I'm looking at it now. We encourage you to look at some of the pieces we mentioned as long as you're not driving. (laughs) There is kind of a funny story about that piece. I don't know if I should tell it. Is it well, of course you should. (laughs) This is kind of an exclusive. Oh, let's hear it. (laughs) This one. Um. I, I I use models even when it comes to figures of the Savior, and I've used 10 or 12 different models over the years as kind of a starting point. But this was early in my career, and I didn't even have any money to hire a model. And so I actually used myself for the pose, and I made up the face of Jesus. And so I uh, I had a little makeshift studio in the basement of our house. We'd moved to Provo. And we'd just been there a couple of weeks, and I started this painting. And I dressed myself up in these robes. <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm like Norwegian. I'm like the worst model for Jesus you can imagine. I had a mustache at the time, but not a beard. And I had a mirror set across the room so I could, like, check my pose. And my camera was on a timer on a tripod. So I'd photograph myself for this painting. This is going to totally ruin this painting for anybody <laughs> who sees it. But uh, I was such a bad model. I thought, I've got to, I got to do something to look, maybe create a better profile for Jesus. And so I got an idea. I ran upstairs and I got into my wife's sewing closet and she had some quilt batting. And I glued quilt batting <laughs> onto my face <laughs> and painted it dark to make a beard. And I re- looked really hideous. It was just r- crazy. I locked the doors to the house. This was the middle of the afternoon. My wife was gone. Kids were at school. And so I'm taking pictures of myself in these robes with quilt batting glued to my face. And I don't know how long I'd been doing this. And the doorbell rang. <laughs> and I, look, I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, I'm not going to answer the door. But then I realized it was about the time the kids get home from school and I had locked the door. So I I ran upstairs, go to the front door, I unlock it, open it, expecting to see my kids there trying to get in. And instead, I see this lady 
I've never seen before with this, I think it was like a welcome basket for the new family. Relief society. Yes, (laughs) the the new family that's moved into the neighborhood. And I tried to explain what I was doing and she was so shocked. She just about fell off the porch, but you know. She had no idea what a weird, strange <laughs> dude had moved into the neighborhood. So anyway, that's where that painting started. And I apologize if I've totally ruined it for anyone. You heard it me. here yeah. first, folks. <laughs> so, that is a Latter-day it. Contemplation exclusive. The origin story yeah. of Greg Olson. So Greg, let's let's now transition to today. And you've been doing this for 30 plus years Obviously successful, well-known uh, art and name in the at least in the Latter Day Saint community. By the way, how far does does your influence reach? Is it outside of our faith tradition? Yeah, actually, uh, probably these days it's kind of the scales have tipped, where maybe sixty percent of the collectors uh, of my work are non LDS. Forty percent, you know, come from Latter Day Saint background. How great so, is that? Yeah, it's. It's a bigger audience, isn't it? (laughs) So you've been doing this for a while, and I think that you've probably got some ideas about how you like to do things and the way you want to convey the messages that you intend for your audience. And so I had this question, and I asked you this a couple weeks ago when we sat down at lunch, and maybe you've had some time to think about this, but I want to talk about the image of Jesus that you paint from a couple perspectives. One perspective is, first of all, how do you come up with that image? What is it about the way you paint Jesus that resonates for you? Well, Riley, we just heard the story of how he came up with the image <laughs> yes, of Jesus. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is very uh, like a conceited yeah. self Yeah, I have this uh, weird absorbed. God complex. Where <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's yeah. more to the story. No, I, I think there must be. Uh, I don't know. But how do you come up with your image of Jesus? Uh, first of all, it really is the hardest subject I can think of, especially when you're presenting it to people who are Christian, who they themselves have a belief in Jesus. There's several factors that are involved. First of all, most of us are highly influenced by the images we, we've we grown up with. I mean, I, I looked at all the same pictures everyone else did, and I've discovered that at least in most audiences, there is a certain spectrum of a look that people will immediately recognize as someone, an image representing Jesus. You know, a certain look. And and it may be totally off base, but that's what people have gotten used to. You know, these the European paintings that uh, go hundreds of years back, we... We've all been exposed to those, and I think they kind of formulate a certain look for us. And so I I was influenced by that. I also was trying to create images. I mean, like I say, I've been doing this for, as I think about now, I mean, it's like 40 years. There weren't nearly as as many images available when I started doing this as, as there are now. And I think it's wonderful that there are so many different options for people, for a lack of a better word, that one person is going to connect with one image and another person with another image. So uh, it, it, it it's nice to have variety, but I think uh, for me, I was also trying to capture my feelings about what the idea of Jesus is for me. And many of the images that I grew up with so were kind of, some of them were frightening. <laughs> I mean, they were uh, sometimes harsh or unapproachable. And so I I was trying to create images that I could connect with. And, uh, and looking back, I recognize, you know, many of them I would maybe do differently now, or my, mm. my thoughts about him have, have changed. I've I've tried to move a little further away from the, uh, you know, the very Caucasian, uh, you know, sandy haired look that, you know, sometimes I've portrayed. So it's a, it's a really difficult thing. The one thing I've tried to do is make him just a believable human being, somebody, you know, 
if we had actually met him, he probably didn't have a glowing halo around his head. As artists, we use those kinds of devices to identify this figure as somebody important, as somebody special in our paintings. But if we had, you know, met him on the streets of Nazareth, he probably would have appeared as a man of the neighborhood. And for me, there's something kind of endearing to that thought, not to be disrespectful or or lower his rank at all, but certainly there was that human side to him. And sometimes in elevating him, we also push him further away. And for me, I I needed something that was within my grasp. And so You've you've drawn him closer through your paintings then? I've for me, I've tried to. And it's you know what other people do, if they relate to it, it's I, I doubt it so much because of the image I've created. Uh it's probably more because of what they bring to the painting. I think that's a, an important factor. You know, Riley, you've got a guitar over here in the corner. And music, I've always been envious of music because that art form can like reach out and grab somebody and just take them whether they want to go or not. It just... By the way, on that guitar, you see that painting? Oh, yeah, that's good. I did Wait, that. Really? I did that. See? Amazing. It's a copy. <laughs> But I did I, it. I, I did it with awesome. Prismacolor, so that's, that's Hoku size really? views of Mount Fuji. That's awesome. Yeah. So I painted that on my guitar. Right. So I got well, a little bit of skill. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I don't in, know if we can uh, Google that one. <laughs> no, you can't Google it. No. Well, no. Hey, but I want to ask you a question that's related to what you're talking about because I think this is fascinating. You mentioned that almost to remove the question of who is this person, you painted Jesus in a highly recognizable way for at least a, a large segment of your intended audience at the time. And I think this is super interesting because in the past you mentioned halos and that was a way for like an ancient or, or in, you know, Western iconography to identify a saint right. or, or Jesus himself or someone like that, right? It was put a halo on him, but then that wasn't enough, right? So if you put a halo around some random painting, it's like, but which saint? Right. And so there, there, there started to be this tradition in iconography of specific symbols. And you see this all through Catholic art and Orthodox right. art where there's a set of the keys. Uh, yeah. And who's that? You know, that's St. Peter. Or you've got arrows, you know, poking out of a guy. Well, who was martyred by, you know, arrows or, or stones, you know? And you can identify the saint by this symbolic iconography uh, in the in the work of art. And you've, you've at least... A, from what I've seen of your art, you've, you've kind of foregone the standard symbols and you've, you've almost allowed people to immediately recognize the individual, but then get beyond the symbol into what the approachable Jesus, as you, as you described him. And I notice this in a lot of your artwork, it's Jesus, you know, he's extending a hand to someone who like the, I, I don't know the names of them. You'll have to help me, but he's holding. I probably don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one where he's holding the child and then he's got his hand extended oh, to another right. child in the river. Right. Right. Or be not afraid. Be not afraid. Yeah. So look that one up, folks, if you have the chance. So that kind of thing is, it, it allows you to communicate a different side of Jesus that isn't about his appearance because you've, you've, that's a given for a certain right, right. segment of the population. Now, as you've progressed and matured through your art, you said that you would probably paint him differently. And I, I like this this maturation or um, this metamorphosis because I, 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 think, I think what happens with paintings of Jesus is oftentimes the image that people see that's immediately recognizable gets repeated by a lot of artists and then that almost becomes Jesus for yeah. the people who are viewing yeah. it. I don't know about you guys, but the the image that I grew up with, I was born in 1969. The image of Jesus that stands out from my youth is Warner Salmon's work. He, he died in 1968, Chicago artist. One of the things that he did in, you know, is to put Jesus among sheep or to have him knocking at the door. And those those are other ways that you could identify him as Jesus or with children, of course, you know, he already has to look like Jesus and have the children uh, sitting on his lap. And we still, we still see that in paintings of Jesus, but these are recognizable scenes from his ministry as described in the Bible, right? 
And you depart from that somewhat. You kind of create Some, new scenes. Yeah, I make up scripture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of my images aren't necessarily uh, illustrated scripture stories. It's really a concept I have about, you know, what he means to me or, you know, the Christ consciousness concept. You know, how how would I see things how would i see people if i could see through his eyes you know what how how did he see the world and and you write it um uh, you know there's there's the first glance at a painting and you know there's a picture of jesus but it's like i was saying with music it it kind of immediately takes you away it has a tremendous power to do that but with the visual arts you kind of have to slow down long enough to have a conversation with the with a piece of art. And it, it's, for me at least, it's only then that you get past that initial visual, you know, recognition of what this is. But if you, if you will make that effort, the artwork will then give back to you. It's almost like you can have a conversation. You can learn something about the work. You can learn something about the way you interact with it. For me, that's the, the wonderful part about about art and that can be very personal depending on who the viewer is and that's when it becomes kind of magical. Greg, you bring up another another contemplative practice that those of us who don't paint can practice and that is looking at paintings, right? I, and and as you say to actually spend enough time to enter into a conversation with it, right? I myself have spent countless hours at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston with my favorite Monet's, just sitting, looking at them. And, and with other artists, you know, with other favorite works. And that every Thursday I'd go, when, uh, when it was free for Houstonians, I, I was a Houstonian at the time, and just sit and contemplate those paintings. Yeah, that's a great experience. It really was. You bring up a great point about how to view these things and make it relatable for people who maybe aren't um, strong in their appreciation of art. I mean, so I love art. I can sit in front of a painting for 20 minutes, half hour, hour if I want to and stare at it and get something like as you described. My wife, not so much. She she appreciates the beauty of it and then wants to move on to the next piece. And, and, and that's just a preference and that's fine. Um, but if you can relate what that is like to someone who doesn't already have that kind of bent, it might be akin to reading scriptures versus diving in and studying scriptures or or practicing a Lectio Divina, for instance, where you're actually contemplating what the scripture has to reveal to you for an extended period of time. Or in music, it, it might be, okay, well, that was a great rock song, but did you get the complexity of the, of the voicing? Right. Um, what about the time signature? What is that revealing to you? And I, I think that's a way to relate it yeah, to people who might yeah. understand music, who might understand, you know, scripture or literature, but maybe don't get art. I, yeah, I like how no, you describe I that. I think that's true. And so I think some people probably worry about what was the artist trying to say here and, and decipher that. You know, maybe who cares about that? I would encourage people to, I, I, if they have even just a few minutes, to look at something and say, you know, what what do I find in this for me? What, whether it's symbolism or just an emotional reaction or a memory, let it just trigger something in you and, and then you run with it. One of my favorite things is to have somebody come and tell me what I was trying to paint, you know, what I meant when I painted this piece. And it's always fascinating. Sometimes it's way better than what I had in mind. And I, I'll say, you know, can I use that? Because that's really good. Well, you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago this idea of Christ consciousness. And I want to I want to point out one of your probably most famous paintings, at least in my estimation, is is it O Jerusalem? Is that what yeah. it's called? Yeah. And this is a this is a painting of Jesus sitting on a, a hillside outside the gates of Jerusalem and kind of staring out over the city. And and it almost calls to mind for me this idea of the contemplative Jesus. And what what were you thinking when you when you painted that one? Well that the idea for that piece was born uh, we had a chance to go to 
Israel for the first time, Jerusalem. And we climbed up the Mount of Olives one evening and watched the sunset. And I think like, you know, for anyone who goes there, your imagination is always traveling back in time, trying to remember or imagine what it might have been like when Jesus was there. And so I had the idea for that painting when we were sitting there looking at a sunset and and just the setting put us in a very meditative mood of stillness. And, uh, it, you know, I, I, I thought of the scripture where it talks about him lamenting over the people in Jerusalem, you know. Oh, Jerusalem, yeah, how Jerusalem. Often would I have how gathered often, yeah. you. Um, and, and I think that invitation is still open to all of us, you know, in a figurative way. He wants to, to gather us under his wing. And that's, that's a, you know, that's a very comforting, deep kind of concept to have him gather us in and, nurture us and teach us maybe a lot about ourselves. I find in in trying to discover and explore the divine, the greatest discovery for me has been, wow, that's what we are, you know. And I think Jesus would want us to look at that, you know. There's something to be said for worship and, and, uh, you know, revering him. But I think with our own children, or if you're a teacher, you know, a parent, what's most gratifying is to see a student or a child sort of finally get it, and they they recognize who they are, and and what they blossom into does more for us than any you know praise or admiration they could heap on us. Yeah, I've always I've always thought that you know God, Jesus, they don't need our yeah. adoration, they don't need our reverence. Um, in terms of from a worship standpoint, right, right, they don't right, need right, that. Right. So there must be something outside of that that they that they do desire, and or, or maybe they're completely devoid of desires. <laughs> but I, I I tend to think that they really feel good when we relate to them in in just a very familial friend kind of way. That resonates with me. Maybe you know there's some people that might be offensive to. I don't know. I know and there I, is. Yeah. And and that's another thing I've realized. Everybody's having a different experience here. You know, I had a, a woman once, she was a gallery owner, and I was doing a show at her gallery and she was very complimentary of, of most of my work. She, but she said, Greg, you have one piece that I hate. She said, no, hate is not a strong enough word. I wow. abhor this image and I'm like wow tell me about it what is it and it was a picture it's called uh, children of the world it's Jesus surrounded by all these children in native costumes from their homeland and uh, and a couple of the kids I mean some of them are interacting with Jesus and some are interacting with each other there's one little girl she has a rabbit a little bunny and she's showing it to another girl and she said this gallery owner said, I hate this painting. If Jesus were really there, those kids would be paying attention. They wouldn't be messing around with bunnies and stuff like this. And it was really offensive to her because it seemed disrespectful. For no, someone wouldn't. else, it was like, oh, they they felt love and they felt comfortable. This was their friend there. So it's it's a different experience for well, everybody. I mean, that's a good point. Bruce R. McConkie had a famous falling out with a BYU professor, which anyone can find this on the web. Um, And it was over the idea of a personal relationship with Jesus. So doesn't that kind of speak to that, right? And the differences of experience we all have. So one of the things we do, Greg, when we have a guest on, and and we we do this as a check-in for ourselves a lot, is to ask the most important contemplative question. Where are, where am I? But we would ask this of you. Where are you? Where's Greg Olson today? Oh, Take your time on that That's a really one. big question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I am on a journey and it's not, you know, the scenery is not always the same day to day. And, and, and honestly, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful thing. It's also been, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, gut wrenching because my my I I feel like my spiritual life 
is um, probably better personally than it's ever been. I my my relationship with with myself, my own divinity, and whatever is divine in the universe, I feel I feel closer to that than I ever had. But I've also had to admit to myself that there is a whole lot I don't know. Things that I thought I knew for certain, I've had to put a question mark by them. That's kind of my wife's favorite saying is just, and this isn't necessarily popular in our culture, to have a question mark uh, with things. But it's also a place that I feel like allows me to be open to truth wherever I might find it. And I find that in our own culture and community, in the church. And I also find it in lots of other places, other people. Um, so I, I I feel like I'm just a, a baby in so many ways, spiritually. I, I have a hard time uh, saying I know things in the way I used to say it because I've had, I've re-examined what made me say that and and I don't always feel the same as I did then in my surety of, of, of everything. But but I'm also at total peace with that, with the uncertainty of things. And I feel I feel a divine presence sort of leading me, and and I've I've let go of a lot of fear that I used to have. I've let go of a lot of judgment that I used to have. I've let go of a lot of maybe spiritual arrogance that I, I once had. And, and again, I see everybody's on their own journey and it's probably not for me to be the judge of where people are. I, I've, I've settled much more on trying to make love the answer for most questions and to do that's what I see in Jesus's example. That's the symbol he is for me to try to love as purely as I can and to just try to understand, you know, don't try to fix everybody's problems. Just try to be there for them and sit with them and have empathy for them because it it's a journey for all of us. And, and we may be somewhere next year that we never thought we would be, you know, sitting where we are now. And, uh, and I think as brothers and sisters, we, we owe compassion and understanding to, to each other. So that's a wishy-washy answer or a, a vague one. <laughs> Comes with the uncertainty. Yeah, I right? guess, I guess. Greg, something you said really struck me, something ironic, something oxymoronic, um, and that is spiritual arrogance. <laughs> spiritual arrogance. Isn't that funny? You know, as a, as a culture, as you mentioned, we really, and when I say we, I mean, firstly, as Americans, and maybe even more so as Latter-day Saints, we have this very, this is something that comes up from time to time on the podcast. Travis and I talked about this recently on one of these podcasts, whether on this podcast or on the Our Sister podcast as a guest co-host. And that is that because we don't have the training uh, in our education, like say Europeans do in terms of literature and, and things that, that make us think more, well, I, I think I can say contemplatively, that make us think about possibilities, alternatives, different ways of thinking about things. We have a very pragmatic philosophy, if we have a philosophy. We've never been philosophers, put it that way, as Americans, ex except for pragmatism, you know. And so we really are enamored with having the right answer as Americans and especially as Latter-day Saints. And what I heard you say that as you let go of that, as you at least put a question mark next to it as a possibility, okay, maybe this is true. I like to think of that question mark as in parens, right? If you put that, that question mark in parentheses, it's sort of a maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And as you allow for that space to open up, you, you actually allow Jesus, you allow the divine, you allow God to reveal itself, right, to you as it is, not in your preconceived notions, not in your catechism, 
not the one that we that we you know we say we don't have as Latter Day Saints, and yet what did we do? Somebody asked Joseph Smith, "What do you believe?" He gives the twelve articles of faith, and they become catechism. And we actually had catechisms that we had primary uh, children memorize in the same way that that Catholics do. I've seen them myself. You know, these are I'm talking about old, out of print books. You know, but as we as we allow the possibility that we don't know everything, that we don't have God all figured out, we allow God to reveal to us who God is, what God is, how God is. And one of the ideas that I like that goes right along with that, Chris, is this, rather than having an exclusionary theology that says, this is the answer, all other answers are wrong, by incorporating this inclusionary theology where it's yeah, that's probably right, and so is that, and that could be too. And it's both and rather than either or. Opening up possibilities is one of the benefits of allowing for uncertainty and, and living with question marks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this day and age we live in with the Internet, there's so much information out there. And, and this rising generation, this is what they're growing up in. I I I think of my own family, my kids, the things that that they live with on a day to day basis. Uh, it's it's a different church environment that they're growing up in, and they deal with questions that maybe a lot of us uh, didn't grow up with. And I think, if nothing else, if we if we can just realize that uh, people. People will form opinions, people, members of the church, about different subjects based on their own experience, information they've been exposed to. And, and in some ways, we have to be understanding of that. Be, I'm, I'm, our church history, for example, is, you know, it's messy enough that we should at least be understanding of some members who are challenged by that. And not just, you know, throw them out the window to to be with them, to sit with them, to be understanding and not, you know, I hate this kind of, you know, informal uh, shunning that sometimes we do when, when people are perceived to feel a little bit differently. Hopefully, you know, love can prevail in those situations. And if we, we see that most often in when it's members of our own family that ha- that see things differently, boy, there for me nothing's worth you know cutting off that association just because someone sees things a little differently, interprets things a little differently. I think the gospel of love is big enough to handle those kinds of differences. If I can use the the term Mormon, there's more than one way to Mormon. Yeah. I, as a verb yeah <laughs> i i have found that to be true so what's next for greg olson where do you see yourself going with your art what are you doing currently that might be just slightly different from what you've been doing and where do you see yourself going in the near future oh wow that's a really good question uh <laughs> um i've been interested in doing some things that maybe are inspirational at least that would be the goal but maybe beyond just images of Jesus and in trying to respect the subject matter sometimes you know it can feel like you're just a machine like okay pop out another painting of Jesus Jesus with kids Jesus with sheep Jesus whatever and 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 I think I would like to reserve those paintings for when I feel like I really have something to say and and maybe spend some time uh well here's an example and and after conference weekend, I'm not sure but i i've been I've been intrigued by the divine feminine you know there aren't a ton of images out there that sort of reflect that concept i have five daughters one son and you know i i i see you know what does that mean for 
for my girls? Is, is, there, is there imagery that could be out there that would give them uh, a healthy concept of their own divine nature as a woman? Mm. I have no idea what that imagery would be. I'm, I'm wrestling with it, but that, you know, you there are some artists out there that yeah, are painting there are, there divine are feminine type yeah, subjects. Yeah. And in a way, it, it sounds even kind of oxymoronic to say divine feminine, you know, objects or subjects right. because it is a mystical <laughs> concept in yeah. and of itself. Yeah. A, a lot of people think, well, divine feminine, heavenly mother. Yeah. And that's, that's an aspect right. or a exactly. symbol for the exactly. divine feminine. So as you're contemplating these ideas around the divine feminine, what do those look like? Have, have you gone well, into that yet? Have you started those? Oh, yeah, I, but I, I honestly don't have an answer for that. I mean, I, there are lots of different uh, avenues you could take, and that's actually part of the process I'm in right now is, I don't know if you'd call it research, but you know, I spend a lot of time you know, seeking ideas and that was kind of part of my little vision quest uh, week this last few days uh, out camping by myself. Just Now, you didn't say vision quest before. <laughs> you, you were just out there looking at stars and contemplating. Yeah. Now I'm intrigued. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you come up with. Yeah, well, I'll, I can't wait either. <laughs> we'll see. So if you have any ideas, pass them along. It's, uh, well, we did do an episode on the Divine Feminine with uh, Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Which was one of my personal favorites, Chris. I started listening to that. I haven't Good. completed it, but yeah, great material. One thing we did, Greg, in preparing for that episode, we knew we wanted to do it for a long time. We knew we needed the right guest, and and we knew we needed a, a feminine voice, you know. And one of the things that we did in addition to that is we reached out and we asked for questions. So as so as uh, as you've suggested, Greg, others might reach out to you with their ideas how can they do that absolutely well uh, how would they find you uh i think on my website there's contact information or if the two of you hear anything please pass it along i'd love to i'd love to have input especially from women because uh yeah as you talked about on your podcast it it's it's fine for us as men to sit and uh you know, theorize about what would be helpful or what would be of interest to them. But that's, that's really, I guess there's a message that could go to men regarding the the value of the divine feminine, but that's another facet of it. I, I'd like to speak to the women themselves in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, we could theorize, like you say, a lot. And one of, one of the ways we've thought about this is to say that you know, if there's sort of a Venn diagram with men and women uh, as as bubbles in this diagram, right. and and you you know you overlap one or the other with divine feminine, there's going to be a lot more women overlapping with divine feminine, right? I mean, that's that natural proclivity. Uh, it's not exclusive, but you definitely want to mine female voices for ideas and thoughts about the divine feminine. Yeah. It's it's interesting to note, guys, that that the word theorize comes from the Greek theoria, which means contemplation. Mm. Oh, interesting. Chris is quite the uh, <laughs> etymological wordsmith. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Greg, is there anything that you wanted to finish with? Any last thoughts? Uh, we're, we're rounding out over an hour now, but that's where we normally keep oh, it. But what what no, thoughts no, did I, you have? I just want to say thank you again to, to you guys and what you're doing. Uh, it, it's been a blessing to members of my family to have just a you know a little bit of a nuanced look at uh, the things we believe in, and you seem to find good and value in what's already here, but also your ideas touch some of us who might be you know a little more nuanced and and i think that's a real treasure so thank you thanks for that endorsement greg appreciate that and and we've really appreciated being here um telling us your story being vulnerable expressing the importance of art for you and i i think that anyone listening to this should absolutely dive more into the visual arts and art in general 
as a way to contemplate the divine within. I mean, it really does reveal a lot to us. Indeed. Thank you. Well, again, Greg, thanks for being here. Chris, did you have any last thoughts? Only to say thank you, Greg, and thank you, Riley, and thank you also to Christian Hurtado, my son, for editing this podcast. Yeah, this one's going to take some work. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, I'll invite Greg and, and other listeners to review the podcast uh, wherever you do that. Where do you do that, Riley? Oh, Stitcher, Apple, Google Play. We're on all the major podcast providers. Please like, comment, subscribe. And we really appreciate your feedback. So let us know your thoughts on this episode or any other. You can reach us at Latter-day Peace Studies on our Facebook page or on Messenger if you want to just message us directly, Christopher Hurtado and Riley Risto. So you can find us there. So for Latter-day Contemplation, I'm Riley Risto. And I'm Christopher Hurtado. Have a great week, everyone. 